Good morning, everybody. My name is Chase. I get the privilege, the honor to pastor here at River's Edge uh, and to preach, to bring the word a little bit. Uh, before we get going, we, we've been kind of making this a big deal, uh, talking about every week that we want to encourage you, if you have a physical Bible, to bring it with you every week. We're going to try to you know, be a little more intentional about pointing to ways you can, you can allow this to help you throughout the week. And so uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, this year we bought a bunch of Bibles to give away and you took them all. That's great news. It's like a big win, but we had to order more and they got stalled somewhere. So this week I went and just this week, no, this morning, I just went in the back hallway and found some more Bibles. So they're not the, the beautiful fake leather that we had for you. <laughs> they're just plastic covers, okay? So if you want one of those, there's still some at the back here. If you want a Bible, it's yours. It's our gift to you. If you want to wait till the, 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 the fake leather ones come back next week, you can do that too as well. We just want to make sure you have a Bible in your hand uh, as we believe there's something Something cool that happens having a, a physical one uh, as you can follow along throughout the service. So we're in a series called Flipping Tables. Interesting, Flipping Tables. Uh, and I want to start where we started last week so, so we can all be on the same page because we just started the series last week. There's a time where, where God himself speaks to a man named Moses to tell Moses who he is and what he is like. Now, this is not a time where someone describes God and what they believe God is like. This is a time where God himself says, this is who I am and this is what I am like. So I would encourage you to lean in when that happens. And I want to read it to you. This would be one of those places in your Bible that is worth highlighting, underlining, circling, whatever you got to do so you can recognize this is a pretty important place. It's Exodus chapter 34. So if you want to know where that is, it's not very far. Genesis Exodus, so second kind of book in the Bible, and then just find up at the top, it'll say Numbers, and then, you know, 34 comes after, 32. <sighs> all right, well, we're getting there, all right, good start, good start, 34 comes after 33, okay, and it says this in 34 verses 6 and 7, it says, uh, the Lord passed in front of Moses calling out, Yahweh the Lord, that's the God's name, his proper name is Yahweh. He says, I am the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. Now, we, we started there because we wanted to understand who God is like. God is full of love and compassion and mercy. He lavishes love to thousands of generations. And that's the, the part of God we love to talk about. That's who we think of God. That's what God is known for is his great love and compassion and mercy. And we know this, that Jesus is the exact representation of God. He is the very character of God. He, he represents the character of God perfectly. And so if God is all of this, so is Jesus. Jesus is full of compassion and mercy and unfailing love and faithfulness. When we think of God and Jesus, those are the lovey words we love to use to describe him. And that's good because that's what God and Jesus are known for. But God doesn't just stop there and only give us these really happy, smiley, feel-good words. He says, but I do not excuse the guilty. And I am slow to anger. God gets angry, although he is slow to angry, angry, <laughs> anger. And if that is true about God, remember, it's also true about Jesus. Jesus. And so what this series that, that I wanted to do in this series is take a look at the few moments in scripture where we see Jesus, who is known for his love, get angry, get a little frustrated and see if there's anything that we can take away from those stories and apply to our life. Anything that we can take away from those stories to help us become better followers of Jesus. That, that's kind of my hope and prayer. One of the most famous stories where Jesus gets frustrated and angry is the time where he flips tables in the temple. Hence the series title, Flipping Tables. There you go. Uh, I think we'll get to that next week. But today, it's kind of funny, as I say, all of that to get you introed. We're actually looking at a time where I don't think Jesus was angry. <laughs> Good job, Chase. To look at the handful of times Jesus is angry, and then the very second week, you don't look at a time that Jesus was angry. 
Well, the thing is, though, in what we're going to look at today, Jesus says some things that you're going to hear me read, and you're going to go, Jesus said that? That doesn't sound very compassionate and merciful and loving. And that's why I felt it was worth throwing into this series, because he says something that you go, man, that sounds harsh. That sounds tough. And at first glance, you may not understand how important what he said is. So, so that's why I think it fits in our series. We're going to be in a, a book called Mark, a letter. Uh, this is about three quarters of the way through your Bible. So if you just flip, you'll get to the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah, Malachi, sorry, Malachi, my bad. Read that wrong every time. Then you'll get to Matthew, and then you'll get to Mark. I was walking through it and... We're going to go to chapter 9, and, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read the whole thing first, let you gasp, and then we're going to unpack it. And actually, before I get to, I just want one sentence to focus on. Before we get to the one sentence, we, we have to talk about a concept that I promise in the room, you're going to go, oh, I chose to come to church today, just for a second, Okay. But we don't get to just pick and choose the fun, happy things that the Bible talks about. Um, and, and my goal is not to make you uncomfortable. My goal is to explain God's word to you in a way that can help you become more like Jesus. Okay? Uh, so, so let me read the whole thing. And then let's talk about a concept for a little bit. And then we'll get to one sentence that will mess with your brain the rest of the week. All right? You good? Not yet. You're like, I don't know what I'm good for. <laughs> just say yes. Just, just. All right, good. We're good. All right, here we go. Um, verse 42. It says, but if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one foot than to be thrown into hell with two feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where maggots never die and the fire never goes out. For everyone will be tested with fire. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? You must have the qualities of salt among yourselves and live in peace with each other. Now you understand. <laughs> that, that's, I mean, I'll be honest with you. At first glance, we go, that's... that's fun. That was the word you were thinking of? No. That's tough. And, and before I get to the challenge, the very first sentence is all I really want to focus on. I felt it necessary to focus on something that is probably not talked enough about. Even in the church, something that, that doesn't get a lot of attention often, and that's the reality of hell. And I'm not going to dive deep into this topic and, and, and unpack it very clear of what the Bible says about it and what it doesn't. Because in, later on in this year, we're going to do a series called, uh, What Happens When We Die? <laughs> You're like, man, can you tell me when so I can come back? No, because <laughs> I want you to come back. And we're going to talk about heaven and we're going to talk about hell. And we're going we're to talk about some stuff that the Bible says. And we're going to get to understand what does the Bible say and not say. Not what someone thinks. Okay? But when I get there yet. But I do feel it necessary to understand the seriousness of what Jesus said for us to at least talk a little bit about the reality of hell. So I'll say this at least about hell, that it is real. That it is a place of separation from God. And Jesus himself talks more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. He speaks on it. And if Jesus speaks on it, at, at least for me, that, that's a pretty big deal and it's something that I want to pay attention to. See, our understanding of hell shapes the view of, our view of the gospel and of God. If we don't accept the reality of hell, I think it's going to be hard for us to fully comprehend the good news of the gospel. And we may not fully understand hell and what it's going to be like and what it's not going to be like. We may not even like what we do know about it, but it doesn't give us the right to throw it out and disregard it just because we don't like it. Contrary to what many people try and do, I don't believe that you and I get the right to keep what we like about God and throw out the rest. Amen. I don't think that's our job. I don't think that's how faith or following Jesus works. Many people, including Christians, we like the idea of heaven. <laughs> I love that. 
and of God's plan for redemption, that God loves me enough that he's going to save me for a place where there's no more sadness, sorrow, sickness, or pain, where everything is awesome. Yeah, How many of you like that? Uh, I'm a big fan of heaven. I will talk about heaven all the time. I love that. But I'll just be honest. Hell's not as uh, awesome. It's not as fun to talk about. And and it's hard for us to talk about it and think about it because we don't like the idea of eternal wrath or punishment or people deserving anything negative for their choices or decisions. Honestly, oftentimes Christians, we try to explain it away or, or soften what it's really like. We don't talk about hell nearly as much as we talk about heaven. I'll be real, we're often ashamed or apologize for the concept as a whole. And my guess is, and many Christians listening right now, or many Christians in the world, and many people sitting in the room here, many of you would probably, if you could, just get rid of it. The whole idea. But we can't. See, all throughout scripture, we see that God, although he's known for his love, is also just. Although he is compassionate, he is also holy and perfect. He is forgiving, yet... He does not let the guilty go unpunished. See, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And we can't throw out the more difficult aspects of God and keep the ones we like. Now, we need to remember as we think about this that God's thoughts and ways are not like ours. He is so far above us in how he functions and understands things and how things work that that we cannot fully comprehend heaven or hell, to be honest with you. Francis Chan, he's a a pastor and and writer. And in one of his books, uh, I'm going to put part of it up on the screen here in a second. I'm going to read this quote from one of his books. I'll read the first half, throw the second half up for you. But around this idea and concept of hell and how God's thoughts are beyond ours, he says this, would you... Would you have thought to rescue sinful people from their sins by sending your son to take on human flesh? Would you have thought to enter creation through the womb of a young Jewish woman and be born in a feeding trough? Would you have thought to allow your created beings to torture your son, lacerate his flesh with whips, and then drive nails through his hands and feet? I am sure that I would not have done that if I were God. It's incredibly arrogant to pick and choose which incomprehensible truths we embrace. No one wants to ditch God's plan of redemption even though it doesn't make sense to us. Neither should we erase God's revealed plan of punishment because it doesn't sit well with us. As soon as we do this, we are putting God's actions in submission to our own reasoning, which is a ridiculous thing for Clay to do. In scripture, it talks about God being the potter and we as humans are the clay that he molds us and makes us and shapes us. So he says, it's kind of ridiculous for you and I to think as clay, we'd be like, hey, potter, you're wrong. (laughs) I don't fully understand how God is going to save us and and, and bring us to a place called heaven. I don't get it. But we don't get to pick and choose that which we don't understand the truths that we embrace. I thought that was an interesting quote and concept for us to chew on. We're not God, and, and, and God does have a really amazing and serious plan of redemption for our sins, but he has a really serious plan of justice for sin as well. Hell is, hell is real. And I think to understand the seriousness of sin and what Jesus says here in this text, we need to know the seriousness of the reality of hell. That it, it is sin that sends people to hell. Not God. It, it is sin that leads to hell. And we need to understand this, that it is what all of us deserve. We are all created in the image of God, made for a relationship with God, but every single one of us rebels against God. <clears throat> and it may look different in each of our own lives, but all of us fall short of God's way of living. All of us have sinned against an infinitely holy and perfect God, and we deserve his justice. Yep. The only thing that keeps us from hell is being our destination, destination is the belief in Jesus, that we believe that Jesus came and he died and he rose again for our sin to save us from hell and to save us for heaven. That, that's what gets us 
away from what we deserve. Is that God said, I love you so much, I want to change this. I sent my son to die on the cross for you. And anyone and everyone who puts their faith in Jesus, believe he came, died, rose again, invites him to be the Lord and leader of their life, will spend eternity with me where everything is awesome. So I felt it seems like a good moment to just pause in the service. And if you're in the room and you're listening today and you're like, man, I, I don't know. That sounds really, really serious. And, and I don't know if I've ever placed my faith in Christ. I, I want to give you an opportunity right now that for, right where you're sitting, right in the middle of this service, there's no better day than today to say, Jesus, I believe that I have sinned and I believe that you came, you died and you rose again for me to save me from my sin, to save me from hell and to save me for eternity in heaven with you. I want Jesus to be the Lord and leader of my life. So I want to give you a moment to do that. And because there are people in the room that have already done that, and I don't want it to be awkward for either one of you, I'm just going to ask everyone to just close their eyes for a second. Just, just close your eyes so that, that it's not weird for someone that needs to make that decision and not knowing if it's weird or not. Listen, everyone just close your eyes for a second. If you're in the room and you've already made that decision to follow Jesus, I, I want you to pray that if there's anyone in this room that has not, that God would move in their heart and their life and they would say, today is the day for me. And if you are that person in the room today, that recognizes the seriousness of hell, the reality of hell. I want to invite you, if you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus, to do this. From your heart to God, God, I know I've sinned. I believe Jesus came, died, rose again for me to save me from my sin. I want to be the Lord and leader of my life from now and forevermore. Amen. If you did that, I want to encourage you to find me or one of our pastors. We would love to just celebrate with you. Like this is an exciting thing. We'd love to celebrate with you to help you on this journey as you, as you begin to walk after the ways of Jesus. Now, Jesus didn't talk about hell here as like a, a just wanting to teach on a topic. He wasn't like, oh, let's pick a topical series here, hell. No, he, he talked about hell as a warning for us as followers to recognize the seriousness of sin. But not only for our own life, but for the lives of those around us. Jesus shares these tough challenges with us so that we would take sin seriously. And you heard what I said. He talks about, you know, maybe you should cut off your wrist if, if anything leads you to sin. Or, or cut off your foot if that leads you to sin. Or, or poke out an eye. Now, he doesn't think we should actually do that. Just in case you're wondering what you got yourself into today. He's explaining that you should take serious anything in your life that is leading you away from God's way of living. And we're not even going to touch on that part. Because before he gets to any of that, he says, hey, you should take serious your influence over other people. And be careful not to lead anyone to sin. Be serious about keeping others from sin. And that's where I want to focus Really, our whole time today, Mark chapter 9, the very first verse. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusted me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. Does that line right there make you smile? Not me. I don't love it. That line right there doesn't sound at first very lovey or compassionate. And, and I try to read about Jesus every day, and I try to read this all the time. So I've, I've read this line many times in my life, and I have to be completely honest with you. Almost every time I read that, I pause for just a moment. I'm like, did, did Jesus really say that? Like, it almost takes me back where I'm like, man, that's tough. And it doesn't sound that way at first. It sounds harsh, to be honest with you. Because in case you don't know what a millstone is, it's exactly what you think it is. It's a heavy stone. It was a stone used with mules or, or, or donkeys to grind wheat. And so it was so heavy, you needed an animal that was stronger than me to, to do that. So it was a big, large, heavy stone. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but if you tie that kind of thing around your neck and go into the sea... That's not good. No, that's bad. You're going to the bottom. You're, you're going to drown. 
And that's the serious kind of picture that Jesus paints for them. This is a big deal, right? This sounds serious, correct? Okay. And if Jesus thinks it's serious, I think we should take it serious. It's serious because sin leads us away from God and all of his goodness. Sin leads us to death and sin leads us to hell. So if you are causing even just one of these little ones to fall into sin, Jesus says that's a big deal. Now, if you're wondering, what does it mean, one of these little ones? Well, some believe that it just a, a little bit earlier, Jesus is talking about little children. He says, let the little children come to me. And so some believe he's talking about little children, that that's what this means. And, and it's possible. Many believe that he's talking about believers in general, uh, maybe specifically young or new believers. You'll see in scripture, we're called children of God. So this is not a far stretch at all. Honestly, many people believe that that's what it is. Even if he meant little children... My guess, just me, my guess is that Jesus wouldn't say, hey, don't lead children to sin, but it's totally cool if you lead other adults to sin. At least I don't think so, right? So I think this is worth applying to all believers, that if we lead even just one person who trusts in Jesus to fall into sin, that's a big deal. Does that make sense to you? So I, I'm going to have a help us think about that in general with all believers. Such a big deal that he continues to say when he's talking about us and anything that leads us to sin, he just says, well, cut off your hand or cut off your foot or poke out your eye. But when he's talking about us leading even one person to sin, it seems like that's a big deal too. Almost seems like a bigger deal. Following Jesus is not just about you, it's about your influence around others. So as I started chewing on this a few weeks ago, I, I came up with this word called sinfluence. This is how I would define what he's talking about. When you and I lead other people to sin, we, we have sinfluence in our life. And I started just asking the question, is there any sinfluence in my life? Times where I'm leading someone else to sin. And at first you're like, no, you hope it's not in my life. And then you think about it for yourself is, do I have any sinfluence in my life? And at first glance, we normally go, no, 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 not me. So I came up with a definition, and it's my own definition, so it might be wrong, but I created the word and the definition, so I think it's right. Here's what I would describe and define sinfluence. It can be direct, like when you know something goes against God's way of life, and you not only do it yourself, but you invite or lead or encourage others to do it with you. Hey, I know God's not cool with this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And not only that, I'm going to bring other people along with me. Or it can be indirect. The idea of when you say or do something that may cause someone else to sin by how they see you or respond to you. And I'm going to give some examples, kind of, but I don't really want to get too specific as I'm not sure exactly what my role is in this. See, I believe the Holy Spirit's role is to convict us of our sin. I don't think that's my role to be like, oh, let me point out all the ways that I think you are sinning. I don't think you want me to do that, right? I don't want to do that. <laughs> but I do think, at least today, in this moment, what I'm going to try to do is, my job, I think, is to help you create an opportunity to allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate areas in your life that maybe need some conviction. Everybody say, yay. Yay. Yeah. If this is your first Sunday here today, I promise I love talking about all the good stuff and the lovey stuff and the, and the fun stuff. And I smile more than I cry. And, and I try to tell a lot of jokes. And I try to leave the serious nature to not me. Um, but as I said, I can't just pick and choose what I want to preach when it gets to God's word. We, ha we have to talk about the hard stuff, right? So please, come back. <laughs> and allow the Holy Spirit to do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do in this moment. Here's what I want to do. I want to just give you some relationships in your life that you should think about this question. Am I influencing anyone to sin? Is there any sinfluence in my life? Here we go. Let's start. Let's just, let's just jump right in. Let's, let's not waste any time. How about your spouse? Any chance you're actively doing something that God is not honored by and you're bringing your spouse into that? Now, think about the words that you use with each other the activities that you do or the ones that you don't do, the environment that you create in your home, is it God honoring or not? How about this? Any way that you're provoking your spouse by the way you speak or the way you act, 
that's causing them to respond and sin? You still smiling? <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> Uh-oh. How about your boyfriend or girlfriend? At River's Edge, we have a ton of young people in this place. A ton of young people that call this place home. And, and, and I got to be honest, I, I'm positive of this because I was once a young person with a, boy, with a girlfriend. <laughs> I was going to say with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. She's right there. She's right there. <laughs> and I promise that, that there's some things that you're probably doing in your relationship that God's not okay with. And not only do you keep doing them, but you encourage others and invite others and lead others to, to do it with you. And I know you know what I'm thinking about. I know that I know what you're thinking about. And I promise what you're thinking about that I'm thinking about is what I'm thinking about. <laughs> and just to be clear that we're both thinking about the same thing, I'm going to put it up on the screen so you know what I'm thinking about that I'm thinking about that you're thinking about. You know what I'm saying? Check out what this says. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. That's what you're thinking about, wasn't it? Now, it's not just this. This is not the only way that we sin and lead others to sin and influence others to sin, but this is definitely an issue in our world. Or any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Now, let me just be clear. This is not just for young adults. All of God's holy people should not have a hint of sexual immorality. Is there any chance there's a hint of that in your life? Any chance that not only is it in your life, but you're, you're, you're pulling and encouraging and leading and inviting other people into that with you? How about your kids? Now, when I first thought of this, I'm like, not me. I'm a wonderful parent. Like two stars. Is that good? Five stars. Let's go up a notch. I'm pretty good. I, I, I think... I, don't, I can't think of any way that I directly influence my kids to sin. So I was like, this is good. But let me think about it a little bit more. When I spend a little more time thinking and having conversations and honestly allowing the Holy Spirit to convict, I thought about something I struggle with. I know you can't imagine this with me, but occasionally I like to poke and provoke my children. I know it surprises you. I get it. I, I like to goof around. Sometimes my goofing around turns to poking, turns to prodding, turns to provoking. And sometimes what the response is from my children is anger and arguing that is not necessary. And I thought about this. I wonder if I'm influencing them to do that. I say, Chase, that, that can't be a big deal. Well, in Ephesians, Paul writes again, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. <laughs> the Bible's pretty applicable to life, huh? <laughs> do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Why is this a big deal? Why is Paul saying don't do this? Well, I think it's a big deal because when we provoke and poke and, and prod our kids to allow them to be controlled by their anger, to they respond in unholy, unrighteous anger, I think my influence over them led them to sin. I, I led that. I pushed that. I prodded that just by trying to be a little bit funny and taking it a little bit too far. It matters. It matters how you talk to your kids. It matters how you treat your kids. The influence that you have over them, it's a big deal. How about your friends or your coworkers? Ooh, this will be fun. Ever invite any others into gossip or talking bad about someone else? Not you. How about this? Ever engage in jokes and conversations that are not godly and not good? Are you ever the one that starts those jokes? Ever invite others into those jokes? So, <laughs> I like to have fun. And people that like to, like me, who love to get other people to laugh, oftentimes find themselves going over the line. I, I love to joke. If, if I can make you laugh, that's like, that's like the biggest thing for me. And oftentimes, if you're not laughing, I'm just going to go a little bit further until I get you laughing. And if you don't go, I'll go a little bit further. And there's times in my life where I've, I've gone too far. 
I say, Chase, that doesn't seem like a big deal. Well, right after Paul says in chapter 5, not even a hint of sexual morality, he says this. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> you convicted yet? <laughs> felt like if I'm going to be convicted, you might as well be too. <laughs> Thank you. My hope is that we would wrestle with these texts for ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit can do. So let me close with this. And how about other Christians just in general? I said earlier that contrary to what many people do, we cannot keep what we like about God and get rid of what we don't. And the same is true for his word. We can't do that. We don't, I don't think we have the right to say, well, I like this part, so I'll keep it. Ooh, that sounds too hard. I don't want to keep it. I don't like that one. That sounds not, like we don't get to do that with God's word. That's not how faith in following Jesus works. So I want to ask you, have you disregarded parts of God's word that you don't like and maybe even led others to do the same? There are many Christians, listen, there are many Christians that want to choose parts of the Bible that they keep and parts that they get rid of. And not only do they do this for themselves, but they teach and share with others this false understanding of God and his ways. And I want you to chew on and wrestle with, are you leading other people to fall into sin by ignoring or disregarding parts of God's word? They might look up to you. You might have influence over them and they see you doing this with God's word and they think that that's okay or they think that they can do that and you might have an influence on them that might be leading them away from God's way of living. Now I know what you're thinking. Some of you are, are, are thinking, Chase, that sounds a little bit extreme. Sounds like you're taking it too far. Sounds like you're being a religious extremist with all those rules. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it's a little extreme, but I don't know. Did you see what Jesus said? He was very serious about even just one person that we might lead to fall into sin. He was very serious because sin is a very serious thing. Because it leads people to hell. Away from God's desire and design for their life. Now, I just want to throw this in here because I didn't exactly know where to throw it in, but I wanted to say this. I believe that everyone is responsible for their own walk with Jesus and how they battle temptation and sin and how they live a godly good life. I think, I think everyone's responsible for themselves. I don't think it's all your fault if someone else sins. But Jesus showed us that we have influence over other people. And I think he showed us that we need to be very serious about that. So let me end with, with something encouraging because I know you're all like, you got to be done. The guy's playing, okay? The guitar is playing. Come on. <laughs> Just have him play louder and you'll move faster. But I, I want to end with, I want to end with some encouragement because, because listen, listen, listen. You have influence with people. And it could be sinfluence or what if we used our influence to motivate people for good. Check out this last verse in Hebrews. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. You can influence other people to sin. It's possible by the way you live and by the things you do. But what we should think of ways we can motivate and influence others toward acts of love and good works. To influence others to live and be more like Jesus. Guys, we have that opportunity as well. So as I said last week, I want, I want to close in the same way that we did last week and probably every single week because all I want in this series is for you to, to wrestle with some of this, to invite God to work in your heart for some of this. So we're going to end with Psalm 139. I'm going to read it, but I'm going to invite you to just close your eyes because I'm going to go straight from reading the Psalm into a prayer for you and a prayer for me. Psalm 139 says this, search me Oh God, know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you.
anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. God, my prayer is that each one of us would, would come to you and ask you to search our heart and our mind and our life. And we'd be willing to do the, the hard question that says, God, point out anything in my life. Anything in my life. Anything in the way I think or speak or act that dishonors you, that displeases you, that goes against your way of life. Point out anything that offends you. And God, I, I want you to help me. Lead me away from that. Lead me away from the moments where sin influence is in my life, where I have influenced others to sin. And lead me towards your everlasting life. Lead me towards the influence and motivation of others, of acts of love and good works. To bring them to live and be more like Jesus. That's my prayer for my life, God. That's my prayer for the life of everyone listening. Amen.